So I thought tonight to talk about um, freedom. So sometimes you hear that term in spirituality, you know, I'm seeking to find freedom, you know, liberation. So it sort of raises the question, freedom from what exactly? You know, it's not sort of religious freedom where we get to think whatever we want to think about whatever tradition that we might choose, much, much deeper than that, of course. Um, I mean, that's nice. And <laughs> there's, uh, we're pointing to something deeper here as well. Um, and it also isn't pointing towards the freedom to do whatever silly thing our mind might come up with. You know, I'm free to say whatever I want about whoever, whenever I want to say it, and do whatever I want to do, because I'm free. Not that kind of freedom. Right. So what is it? Freedom, liberation. Those are sort of lofty terms that you know we can hear, and it's, it's like, okay, that sounds that sounds nice, you know. But what what is it actually? I mean, what is it in practice? So I'd suggest that the freedom is freedom from the belief in a personal self. That's the freedom. Belief in a personal self is very convincing, right? I mean, we can look at it and say, yeah, there it is. You know, there's my skin, and that side of my skin is everything else, and this side is me. It's simple. You know, when I look around, everything is seen from this perspective, you know. You know, when the body gets sick or hurt, um, it feels painful in this body. You know, so it's a, it's, it's a very convincing belief. And there's, we're not saying that, well, the body doesn't exist. I mean, clearly it does, right? We can feel it. We can, it's the, the means by which we can sense into the world. You know, it was necessary to get here tonight and to get home and to feed it and take care of it in order to experience whatever it is that we're experiencing, right? So the body is essential to have the experience, whatever it is that we're having. The only question, is that what I essentially am, right? So we're sort of given a hint by the word spirituality that this is sort of an investigation into what um, may lie beyond the material appearance of things. Because the appearance is, seems obvious, right? We can look at each other, we can you know, talk about each other's appearance and it seems to be congruent with what we see. You know, we can certainly feel the body. We can look in the mirror. All of that's true, right? So when we even question whether that's our fundamental existence, you know, it's like, hmm, not so sure that's true, right? I'm not so sure I want to go there, right? Because it, it feels like a denial of what we take ourselves to be, right? So in that sense, it feels scary, you know, if if I take myself to be this body-mind organism, and where this is pointing to is something beyond that identity, I'm not sure that's a good idea, you know? It's who I take myself to be. Not only that, we've spent a long time sort of polishing that identity. Maybe we're not happy yet with everything about it, but, you know, we've got a certain amount invested in it, let's say that. You know, a certain number of skills, certain, I don't know, position, situation, um, 401k account, whatever, whatever we take ourselves to, to have put together. So when we start talking about freedom from the belief in the identity as me, in this body-mind, it's, um, it's not something that 
it's immediately obvious. It's not something that we say, oh yeah, I, I sort of knew that all along. It, it's sort of a new concept because everything that we've been taught from a very young age is, you know, you are an individual. You have a name, you have a family, you have relatives, you have a mother and father, you have an education, you have all, all these things that accrue to you and you have a memory of all of that that's gone before and that is your identity. When people ask you about, well, who are, you know, tell me about yourself, that's the elevator speech that we roll out, right? You know, this is, this is who I am. And so after a few decades, um, it's, it's challenging even to, to question that at all. But what we're not questioning is, we're not questioning the existence of the form, right? Yeah, I mean, it's clear that we need this form to be able to get around in this world. You know, we need the body to be able to breathe, to be able to, you know, stay alive to whatever it is that's happening here. The only question is, is that essentially what I am? Which is a different question. So in, in Buddhism, they have, um, you know, th there's three basic um, tenets from the earliest days of, of Buddhism. One is that um, life, as it appears, is impermanent, right? Things are always changing. Anybody have an argument with that? Okay, so we're good with that one. Okay, and then the second one is, um, uh, you know, there's, there's some aspect of life that is um, unsatisfactory. It feels a little bit clunky. You know, suffering might be too harsh a word, but unsatisfactory. Like, there's always a sense of, yeah, but it, it could be better, you know. Um, you know, it might not be abject suffering. I know that exists in the world, but for most of us, not all of us clearly, but most of us in this country, um, you know, it's not that abject physical survival level suffering day to day. But there is still that sense of um, life's not easy, right? So anybody have an argument with that one? Okay, so number three. <laughs> The third one is no self, right? It's like, hmm. <laughs> you know, not, not a personal identity. And, you know, there's lots of ways that we can identify ourselves, you know, through, you know, through our, our history, our situation, you know, kids, parents, friends, political parties, favorite football team. I mean, there's lots of ways that we can identify our, ourselves, um, you know, when we're, you know, talking to someone else and see if there's a match there. But, you know, if we go back to the, the first principle, like impermanence, we can really see that over the course of a lifetime, all of those things will change sooner or later. You know, so maybe, you know, we don't want to build our foundation on something that's impermanent. You know, our, our truest sense of self um, if we identify as being, let's say, a certain profession, maybe we were really good at that profession, maybe we did it for a long time, but at some point we won't do it anymore. We may have some memory of doing it, but at some point there'll come a time when we're not, it's hard to identify our, myself as I am whatever I took myself to be at some point. So, and you can see people going through that when they when they retire you know people have you know feel quite solid in their careers and then they retire and uh, if they can't find something else to identify with it's like they can the sense of being lost right you know without an anchor without a rudder you know don't know who I am anymore you know so there's there's nothing wrong with feeling good about one's accomplishments, it, it does feel good, right? Nothing wrong with, um, you know, taking a certain level of pride in what, what one can do, offer, function in the world, all of that's, all of that's good. 
again, the question is, but is that fundamentally what I am? Because one day that won't be there anymore. We will be called to let things go. Um, I remember the last year of my mother's life, she was, um, she'd was she had cancer for a, a number of years and would come and go and everything, but this time it was, it was there was no other treatment available. And, and, um, um, and up till that point for many years, 45, 50 years, she had a routine. She, that, that's who she was in terms of caring for the family and cooking and, you know, that function and um, that last year life uh, she had to gradually let that go right just physically couldn't do it and it was um, she was able to do that with um, you know a certain amount of grace to be willing to let that go at, in in stages not all at once but in stages as as she simply wasn't able to do it um, and that was very, for me, it was very instructional to see someone uh, do that um, consciously. You know, when, especially when they had identified as a particular function over the whole, the course of a whole lifetime, right? We don't have to wait till months before death to do that. <laughs> you know, we, we can see, um, you know, just by looking closely at our direct experience of this body and how, we, how we've learned to become quite certain that I am this body, body-mind, um, how do we do that? Right? How, how have we become convinced that there's a separate entity here, there's a separate body, okay? The question is, is there a separate being? And what we can do is look at our direct experience. How, how do we know we have a body? Well, we can see it, we can touch it, we can move around and feel it internally, we can listen to it, talk to itself, right? We can feel the feelings that we have. All true, right? Where is all of that happening? The ability to see. I mean, obviously we need eyes and a brain to interpret the signal that it gets from the eyes. But then there's something that is aware of that image in the mind. Something aware of it. Something aware of whatever sound we may hear. Something aware of the sensation, the only way we know any of those things is that we have this amazing, ordinary, extraordinary capacity to be aware of those perceptions, those sensations. Okay. So the only, <laughs> it's only because of consciousness that we know that we have the body. The body only ever is a perception within consciousness. And within consciousness, within that, let's say, spaciousness, there happens to be a thought that says, I am this body. One thought among many thoughts. And it's our belief that that thought is true that creates the identity. That's it. You know, so when we hear sort of scary thoughts like killing the ego or ego death, all, all we're really talking about is seeing through an illusion, seeing through an illusory belief in this one thought that I am this body. Right?